Congratulations, YouTube. You did it. You wore me down and you sucked me back in. I have too many subscribers here just to walk away entirely, especially with no alternative that truly stacks up and so many copycat channels uploading my shows for me anyway. But we can't forget the THC's account here is on thin ice. And so the YouTube version of the show has to be prefaced with this little PSA, only to say that episodes that contain the kinds of themes that have been regularly banned on YouTube will not appear here. And even with that precaution, there's already enough in the archive to get us removed, so remember that the higher side chats could be banned or put in timeout again at any time. And I won't be able to tell you guys about it. So if you feel like it's been too long since you've heard from me here on this digital, dystopian, draconian, data mining monster of a police state seeking platform, your first step should be to check the HigherSideChats.com for the latest shows. All right? All right. Enjoy. Embrace yourself, because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at the HigherSideChatsPlus.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, tour videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. Masters almost surely have a plan There's clearly maybe something there Beyond the realm of man Until we've thoroughly tested Every last close-chested view Find the more you think you know The less you really do Where would we be without THC? We know the lying to us Just don't know to what degree Where would we be without THC? I said chat show Greg Carwood and Company Alright, higher side chatters, we know making it in this world is like swimming against a river current determined to sweep us away into obscurity. But for the elite class, it's a lush grotto of mingling and networking and, of course, a well-built dam to keep you downstream. Unfortunately, the system just wasn't set up for us, especially when you play things by the book. And why should you when the richest among us have tilted every aspect of the big machine in their favor and insulated themselves against the sullied masses every step of the way? From offering the elite leans a completely different education system than the obedient worker-maker plan the rest of us are on, to tax loops and advantages that only affect the top rungs of the ladder, privileged positions and seats of high paying but arbitrary board seats, and even simple things like better deals on interest rates, insurance, and the rest of it. If you thought things were fair, then you must have eaten the carrot they've dangled over the treadmill to the middle, because our invite to the cocktail party at the end of the world is forever lost in the mail. Well, these are the themes of the latest book by today's guest, Donald Jeffries, entitled Survival of the Richest, How the Corruption of the Marketplace and the Disparity of Wealth Created the Greatest Conspiracy of All. And if you're unfamiliar with Donald's work, he's also the author of a popular novel called The Unreals and also wrote a great conspiratorial tome called Hidden History, an expose on modern crimes, conspiracies, and cover-ups in American politics. His blog is called Keeping It Unreal, and he's been a frequent guest host of Coast to Coast AM as well. A true wealth gap warrior, advocate of economic equality, and chronicler of many conspiracies along the way, Donald, my man, welcome to the higher side. How the hell are you? All right. Thanks for having me, Greg. You got it. Thanks for being here. I think you wrote a great book. If anyone is in denial about the entire system being skewed for the nefarious few... 
They won't be when they're done with survival of the richest because you make a pretty clear case that even from the time you're born, you just don't have the same opportunities no matter how hard you work, but you have to be pretty dense to still be drinking the fair chance for all Kool-Aid because the elite tilting the scales in their favor is like the main paradigm of history, right? Exactly. I mean, you know, this battle has been going on for most of human history. And I think that's why in America, we really ought to pay attention to this even more so than the rest of the world, because we brag a lot. And we certainly from our founding, we talked about building what Thomas Jefferson uh, called a meritocracy, because we broke away from the King of England and the Queen of England. Although, unfortunately, you know, over 200 years later here, we see too many Americans still worshiping these royal parasites, which still exist, the ultimate one percenters, who have <laughs> absolutely no reason for being, do absolutely nothing to earn this unbelievable wealth, don't have to do anything but just kind of exist and walk along and maybe deign to meet the peasants here or there and acknowledge their presence. That's it. And, you know, we fought a war for independence from that. And we wanted to have a meritocracy. And for a long time, to a much better degree than we see now in the last 30 years, especially in the post-war era. You know, I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 56. So I grew up, and it's not just saying the good old days, but it was the best time economically for America. Maybe the only time it's been really strong. And a lot of that was due to the post-war era with the defense contractors and the military industrial complex. Bad things, but they did have an offshoot of building a tremendously strong economy. And so for a long time, any job, that anyone had paid at least enough for someone to, at the very least, rent their own apartment. There was no such thing as like not being able to live on your own. If you worked and jobs were much easier to get. So that's part of the focus of this book because, again, the class war has been waged to varying degrees for a long time. It's still being waged all over the world. I think the latest statistic is the world's richest eight individuals or eight families have more wealth than the bottom half mm -hmm. of the world. So, I mean, people just ought to think of that and take that in course. And I believe that we've talked about, I believe Bill Gates and Warren Buffett alone, they determined a few years back, had more wealth than 40% of America. It's two individuals. So is that what we want in America? I, I don't know. Maybe too many people do want that. But I think that's clearly the giant elephant in the room. And that's why I wanted to write this book. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's an ever increasing squeeze that seems to be getting worse, though it's a long tradition for the top to be screwing the bottom. But when you look at things today, where do you really see the line between the reality of our economic situation and like the narrative that regular folks are sold? Well, I think what most of us consume in terms of we're consuming news, we're consuming entertainment, the culture, the structure as it is, what's left of the establishment, these incredibly corrupt establishment that we have, and I've written about it in other books. But when we consume this, Everyone that's disseminating that reality, that information, whether it's the politicians, the talking heads, the celebrities, the corporate leaders, they are all one percenters to varying degrees of another. Even your local newscaster is probably making, definitely making six figures. So they're in the one percent. I think the one percent starts at 250,000 or something, they say. But at the very least, they're in the top 20 percent. So their problems are not the problems of the bottom half of this country now. One of my main talking points. It's been all over the media. Half of all workers in America, those that are lucky enough to have jobs, 50%, the bottom 50% make less than $27,000 a year. Half the country, that's not enough to live today and anywhere in this country to live on your own independently anywhere. Hmm. I mean, maybe places in Mississippi and Arkansas, you might be able to eke out a small apartment in probably a crime-ridden neighborhood. I don't know. But <laughs> certainly most places in the country, you can't. So that's half the country. And the reason why I talk so much about immigration is because with every wave of immigration that comes in, it's almost all coming legally or illegally from the poorest parts, even poorer parts of the world than our poorest parts. So when you have people coming from Mexico that are coming from desperate circumstances, they're entering at the very bottom of that bottom 50%. So what's happening? We're producing more and more desperately poor people. So it's broadening that 50%. So if we don't do anything about immigration in another decade or two, that may go up to 75%, where 75% of the country is making the ridiculous weights where they can't live on their own anywhere. No one talks about that, about the impact of bringing more and more poor people. There's lots of issues like that, but that's just one example. But the public that's consuming this, the rest of it, I'm doing okay. There's a 20% that are doing okay. I'm not going to starve anytime or go homeless, but when I'm consuming that, I'm aware that I'm looking at 
they're producing that for people like me or people who are doing better than me. That bottom 50%, I guess they watch it like they used to watch the Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous television show and dream about something better. But it's not their reality. And that's the gist of what I'm trying to say is that what's being produced for us and what to the world and to our own citizens is not a reality for half the country at least because they are living in, you know, I think one out of, I think 20% of the households in America have no one working in them. I mean, this it's just we're not a first world economy anymore with those kind of statistics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I got no problem with people being successful, but it's just the alteration of the game, the tilting of the scales, the kind of like closing the ladder off to the bottom rungs that really chaps my ass, especially when you're still sold the bill of goods. It's still like, oh, just work hard. You're eventually going to get there. That's why I always have said the midlife crisis is when you've spent half your life, you can't get it back. And you're like, shit, I'm not going anywhere. I'm never going to get up there to the top. Right. Exactly. You're right. People are sold that bill of goods. And while we've always had these kind of myths, you know, when I was a little boy, everyone was told anybody, any boy, well, they're certainly still not a girl that's grown up to be president, but any boy can grow up to be president of the United States. But, you know, you look into the backgrounds of all the presidents of the United mm -hmm. States, and you see that none of them came from poverty, even the ones that claimed they did. Abraham Lincoln's father was the largest landowner in his county. Harry Truman was a delegate to the Democratic National Convention as a teenager. You don't get to be a delegate at that age without having some kind of connection. So nobody really comes from poverty to go to that point. So it was a myth then. The Horatio Alger stories of uh, rags to riches that were very popular in the late 1800s, early 1900s, were largely mythical, but there was still a possibility. People like Thomas Edison and Henry Ford didn't come from great circumstances, and they were able to obviously achieve great things, but it's very hard for a Thomas Edison, a Henry Ford type now to come along because you need capital. You need money to do virtually anything. And that's another focus of the book is how by having money to begin with, that way a Donald Trump, for instance, can be perhaps as ignorant as he sounds. We don't know if he really is, but he can be that way. But by virtue of being born a multimillionaire, he can become a billionaire. Now, if he had been born the son of a construction worker, an alcoholic construction worker, or living with a single mother, it would matter. There's no way in the world he could ever afford to buy the casinos that made him his fortune. But because he had that capital, I'm not, and I'm just, you know, I'm not meaning to pick on just him, but that's what you found. And I, I looked in the backgrounds of so many celebrities from all backgrounds, and I actually wrote a chapter on it. There was a couple of chapters were cut out of the book for size requirements, but our readers can go to my blog and find that chapter I wrote on relations, on celebrities. And, and I, I went into the backgrounds of actors, musicians, corporate leaders, and showed that virtually all of them, and I mean all of them, came from at least upper middle class, very stable backgrounds. Most of them, though, came from the 1% to some degree or another. They were already rich, in other words. So <laughs> again, rags to riches stories, they're mythical because the way it is structured in America today, if you're born wealthy, it's almost impossibly not to die wealthy and to leave wealth for your children. If you're born poor, unless you're an athlete, perhaps, maybe an entertainer to some degree, especially in the black community, possibly you may be able to become wealthy, but it's a very small chance. But for the rest of us, if you're born poor, you're going to stay poor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you mentioned Trump. Another thing that comes up in the book a lot is just the general theme of failing up that the kind of mistakes these people at the top are allowed to make and keep their jobs or just get a new job is insane compared to you or I and the small little things that get people fired from their only source of income. You go from that to nothing. Yet these people, I mean, even if you get fired, you're probably going to get a couple of mil just for that. It is crazy. Yeah. I mean, you have the golden umbrellas, which can be 40, 50. I think I've seen them as high as 100 million where they give these to lots of times, most of the time, they give them to CEOs who have run the company in the ground, have lost the company money, who've done a bad job by anyone's standards. They pay them to go away. Now, all of us would love to fail like that. <laughs> most of us in our regular jobs, if we screw up and violate some petty policy, or if you live in an at-will state, I live in an at-will or a right-to-work state, it's one of the biggest jokes of all. Right-to-work means right to fire you for no reason. 
they can literally, they don't like your look one day and fire you. They don't have to have a reason. And the vast majority of workers, when they get fired or laid off, they may get a very modest severance package if they're laid off, very modest. But if they're fired or and many times they're laid off, they would be lucky to get a couple weeks pay. Mm-hmm. Again, that's the vast majority. And that's how the system works. So of course, unemployment for people like that is an entirely different situation than an executive that is already probably has at least six figures saved up. Whereas the average American, I haven't seen the latest statistic, but I think the last time I looked, it was, I think, about 70-some percent of Americans that didn't have $500 in savings or something like that. Something unbelievable. Yeah. That's the reality. Most people. So just imagine someone in that 70% group gets fired one day. And so you're devastated. If you own your home, it's going to be foreclosed on because in this job market, you're not going to find a job. And I don't care, you know, Donald Trump touting the same statistics that he very accurately called out for their phoniness since the 1990s when they changed the stats to make the economic picture look rosier all the time, they no longer count the real unemployment rate. Now they report to the public only those people who are presently receiving unemployment benefits. And Trump pointed that out. One of the many great things he said during his campaign, now he's bragging about the same phony statistics saying that unemployment's going down, which is ridiculous. Anybody who's faced that job market in the last few years understands exactly how hard it is for the average person to get a job. The ropes you have to go through and the competition where you may have 200 people for applying what is really a low-paid job with no future at all to it, but even those jobs are hard to get. But if you're in the top 20%, especially the top 1%, if you get laid off, you're going to get a good severance package, so you're not going to feel that same stress, the same pressure to instantly have to go get a job. Instead, you can kind of, and you already have, because you've made more to begin with. Again, money begets money. You already have probably a good deal of savings. So every advantage is built there. I talk about that constantly in the book where, you know, with money, it's an old expression, but you need money to make money. Well, it's just like the rich get richer and the poor get poor. Some of those old chestnuts are very, very accurate. Yeah, they really are. And so my idea for structuring this show is to go through the advantages chronologically in an upper cruster's life versus the rest of us. But we got to talking and pretty much covered the first stage, which is that these advantages start before you're even born. As much of this wealth is multi-generational. And as you said, you've got to have money to make money because the system is set up for large sums of wealth to generate more wealth all on its own. So once you're in the club, it's pretty hard to actually lose. And everyone's starting place is never going to be absolutely equal but this is really on a different level. Exactly. Anybody that will sit there and try to tell me that a child born in desperate circumstances in Appalachia or in the wrong parts of Chicago, in a trailer park in Arkansas, there's almost certainly going to be alcoholism and or drug abuse in that house. Almost guaranteed. And again, why is that? Because poverty begets that. They want to try to drown the reality of their awful set of circumstances. So of course you drink. I mean, the poor have been doing that forever. The poor white trash may be doing meth and the blacks may be doing crack or whatever. You're doing that to try to drown out how dismal your circumstances are, looking at all the rundown neighborhoods, the crime around you, that you're born into that. So even if you somehow are lucky enough, and in most of those times, the dad, if he's even known who it is, isn't in the life, you're going to be lucky to have any kind of male role model around and it's usually not going to be a good male role model, might be the uncle that just got out of prison or something. And there's certainly not going to be support. So if you're in that circumstances and why you look at entertainers and stuff, let's say, oh, I want to be an actor or something. Well, you're not going to be able to, uh, those families can't afford acting lessons or tennis lessons or golf lessons or piano lessons, anything like that, that nurture children and can make it easier Really, the only way you can reach out for that golden ring that, you know, the one in a million chance that you might be able to make it in one of these worlds that lots of people want to make it into show business or sports or whatever. But if you look at that same child, if that same child is born to a bank president, as Bill Gates was, his father was the president of Planned Parenthood. He was born to some very special middle class, not a middle class. I grew up in a lower middle class and it wasn't like that. President of Planned Parenthood, his father was one of his grandfathers was a bank president. His mother sat on the boards of directors and banks and big companies back in the 1950s when mothers were baking cookies. But that's sold to us. 
that someone like Bill Gates, you know, he can become the world's richest man. He was just a middle class person like you. And I know he wasn't. It's how you define middle class. I was reading this morning that Republicans are now trying to sell it that $450,000 a year is the middle class. Well, if $450,000 a year is the middle class, then what is a household that makes $60,000 a year? That's a world of difference. It's not maybe as big as between $60,000 and $40 billion, but it might as well be for all intents and purposes. So, But no one talks about that. And instead, obviously, anyone born in those kinds of middle class households where success has already been established, and I talk in the book about how lots of these sons and daughters of the one percenters can even get into college, and much like we see athletes get into institutions that they're not academically qualified for, but they get into sports. Well, you have the people like the George W. Bushes. But does anyone really think that he qualified academically to be in Yale? No, but he had that Bush tradition. His father <laughs> was politician already, and his grandfather had been a longtime United States senator. So, And most of these families, I trace a lot of them back. The Bushes and lots and lots of these people go back to the Mayflower. That's where we tend to look at, okay, where our elite originally came into the country. Well, you look at these families that are out there, whether it's show business or the corporate world, and you'll find a whole lot of them are descendants of the Mayflower. Hmm. That's really interesting. I know they're largely related to each other or at least networked through all these secret fraternities, but to go back to the Mayflower is really interesting too. Yeah, and it is. And I believe most of those examples are in the deleted chapter on relations, which people can find at my blog. But you just wouldn't believe it. I mean, it's astounding. It surprised even me because I expected to find, especially lots of the actresses, the attractive actresses, I thought, well, you know, they were just casting couch. You know, obviously that's how they achieved their fame, that it's something to do with it. But even most of them came from wealthy backgrounds. So it's astonishing. And it kind of disillusions you when you read it because you think, wow, is there any hope for people? But it's so rare to see somebody break through that. And obviously there are exceptions here or there. And when they do happen, like we've all heard lots about Jim Carrey, you know, a very talented guy, how he was living in a car with his family. They were homeless, I think, when he was a teenager or something. So you have people like that. In the old days, you had people like Joan Crawford and uh, Barbara Stanwyck that were great actresses that came from desperate poverty. But even most of the ones back then, and I gave lots of examples, came from great wealth even back then. So even the early days of Hollywood. And obviously anybody, I haven't found a single executive somebody that's a high-profile CEO, if you look in their backgrounds. I mean, just the fact to go to Harvard or Yale or one of these colleges, you have to have wealth to begin with. I mean, even if you win a partial scholarship or something, tuition fees are so incredibly out of the reach of even middle-class families that, again, you have to be wealthy to even go there. And if you can put an Ivy League school on your resume, that makes all the difference in the world. And that's why another stat I quote in the book is that something like, I think it's 3% of the students at what are considered the top 146 colleges generally. And those are the colleges that make the difference. Again, college degrees are not all equal. You get a degree from Harvard or Yale or something, that's worth you know 100 times what any degree is worth from your state university. So those schools are elite and only 3% of the students come from the bottom quarter income-wise to those colleges. And you can bet that almost all that 3% are athletes that are playing for their sports teams and aren't even academically qualified. They're being used as athletes. So people keep that in mind when they wonder about the upward mobility. It's just, I have the statistics all throughout the book and they kind of run together in my mind sometimes, but they all tell the same story that the good colleges are for people who already have money almost all the time. Mm -hmm. And it is weird because that athlete aspect is kind of like a modern Coliseum gladiator situation of just put them in the middle and they're making so much money off sports. It's just like, we don't really care about these people. Let them fight each other, you know, quote unquote, you can't be too violent these days, but you're just basically throwing them in there to exhaust themselves while you make so much money off their backs and throw them a few shekels for their trouble. Not even in college, of course, you don't get anything for playing there, even though you're generating millions. Right, exactly. And that's exactly what it is. Now, lots of us would like to be exploited like they're being exploited because, you know, <laughs> they're getting lots of beautiful women throwing themselves at them. They're getting perks, lots of stuff under the table, cars and gifts, which once in a while they get caught, the alumni. And that's a whole, another different story, the NCAA. And, boy, they, you know, it's, it's corrupt to the core there. 
We know that, but you're right. And I, I think if we tried to reform that, I think the most sensible way would be to just stop claiming that most of these athletes are students and just hire them and pay them some salary, like minor league football or basketball players. That's what the solution should be. And maybe the university can sponsor the teams or something, but it's just like everything else in America. No one wants to really admit the extent of the corruption. And so we kind of turn the other way and play this game. And we had the situation that we have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with sports on the pro level, at least stop using taxpayer money to pay for these rich guys, stupid stadiums, and then have the citizens get charged ticket prices on top of that and get gouged at every corner. It's a mess. But, yep. you know, the book is just so full of these ridiculous sums of money being thrown around for pretty much nothing at the elite level and many of the small scams and schemes along the way. But on the subject of schools, you talk about this perk where someone who is the president of a major university might buy a multi-million dollar home and take out a loan from the university at extra low or sometimes no interest because, oh, well, you got to live close to where you work. Well, no shit. Everybody <laughs> has to live close to where they work. Right. But, you know, even the advantage on the loan terms is just another thing that is not open to most of us. We just get the crippling debt that you can never escape from the college system. Yeah. I'm sure the, uh, the average college student that has a student loan debt, which I think the average student loan debt is $32,000. The last time I looked, it was, which is a huge amount. I mean, that's like a car payment for a pretty good car, more, more expensive than most of us would drive to be carrying around like that. And something needs to be done because student loan debt is now the biggest debt that we have. It's superseded credit card debt even. Considering how mm. much credit card debt that is, that's saying something. Unlike every other kind of debt, if you declare bankruptcy, which is another perk of the rich. That's why Donald Trump can declare it seven times or something and brag about it, because it's a tool for the wealthy. For the 1%, when they declare bankruptcy, they do it as a business, and it actually works for them. It actually makes them more money. It's not a negative mark again, then, but an individual that declares Chapter 7 bankruptcy or whatever it is, and ironically, under, again, the great liberal Obama presidency, he actually stiffened that up to make it harder for average people to declare bankruptcy. Again, in our twisted perspective of the 1%, they actually sold this bill of goods to, you know, this people are exploiting or taking advantage of bankruptcy. And not the one percenters, of course, they're still out to do, mm -hmm. but the average riffraff who's, you have to be in desperate circumstances to declare bankruptcy. And there used to be some advantages to it. It was the only recourse people had at some point. But there was a huge disadvantage where it killed your credit for about a decade. For about 10 years, so you couldn't get any other kind of loans because that stood out like a huge black mark. Bankruptcy, wow. When the 1% does it, it actually works to their advantage. But when the average person does it, it destroys their lives. And that's just one example of how one particular law works one way for the very wealthy and works in an entirely different way for the rest of us. Oh, yeah. I've seen uh, exposés on credit card companies that talk about the predatory practices and the fact that now things have kind of switched to where they actually have really low credit score people that they go for. Like they've got a category and they target them because they can make more off the shitty interest rate for one and then the late fees and that all yep. boils over. So this idea of someone filing bankruptcy it's like, oh, well, let's get them quick because they can't file bankruptcy again for another X amount of years or months. So in this window, we're going to hit them with those late fees after late fees because we already know they can't manage money. And it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> well, yeah, that's some of the most despicable people in our society that prey on people that have nowhere else to go. And you'll find in all parts of the country, they have like uh, car dealerships that specialize in and you watch their commercials. Sometimes they'll get a, a black football player or somebody, but they're geared constantly. Everybody in the commercial is usually black, and they're trying to gear towards the very poor blacks who have awful credit, and they know they have nowhere else to go to buy a car. And they'll even, in many cases, I wrote about this, where they'll actually put a device in the car where if you're one day late in payment, it don't give you any grace period, unlike most of us get, the car won't start. Jeez. And of course, the interest rates they'll be paying, I mean, you'll be paying for like four cars or something. I mean, you may be paying 30% interest to start with. It's outrageous, but the vast majority of people, 
that I've talked to will say, well, you know, they got themselves in that position. They should have paid their bills. And there's no sense to being, okay, well, some kind of crisis came up that could happen to anybody. And yeah, maybe sometimes it is the result of doing drugs and being irresponsible, surely. But still, they're really hurting only themselves. And then that's, I think, the question that we have to ask about everything, whether it's homelessness or any other thing. Well, what do we do about poor people? Do we consign them to just dying in the streets? Do we want to uh, euthanize them? Do we want to get rid of them? As so many eugenicists wanted, I've written a lot about that in the past. Where so many, including almost all the leading liberals, they're eugenicists. They only want the good stock to go on. So they would like to get rid of this human refuse, which is how they think of it. They want to get rid of all these unsightly poor people that are everywhere. But fortunately, they haven't done that yet. But you have to figure out some way. People have to live. And I think that's why we're going to come to a critical mass here soon with AI, with the technology here. And the fact that we already have far too many job applicants in this country for the amount of jobs that are there. And if millions of jobs go automated, that obviously takes it makes it even fewer jobs. And if you continue to bring more immigrants in who are poor, driving down wages in the process, you're going to have even more people seeking fewer jobs. It's a disaster waiting to happen. No one's looking at an answer to that. There have been trial bases uh, around the world in certain parts about a universal basic income kind of thing. I think you have to go with something like that because there's simply not going to be enough work. Unless you're going to do something like what I would advocate, which would my hero Huey Long, you know, I devote a chapter on the book to Huey Long. And I think I'm trying to single-handedly restore his reputation. Mm -hmm. To me, he's one of the greatest Americans that ever lived. And I think if he was around today, because back in the 1930s, he was advocating a 30, maybe 20-hour work week. This was before his pressure finally got us a 40-hour work week and got us overtime and all the benefits that we take for granted, pensions and things like that, that workers did not used to have before pressure from Huey Long finally got Roosevelt and the establishment Democrats to pass an act in 1938 that granted the kind of protections to workers that we never had before. And you can see people chipping away at that now, especially the Republicans would like to eliminate them. But if Huey Long was around today, I think he would look at the situation logically and realize, okay, the amount of workers, the technological improvements that have been made, productivity we can have now as opposed to the past, we should be probably having a 10-hour work week, honestly, by this point. If you had something like a 10-hour work week, you would have enough jobs to go around for people. But you'd have to pay people enough to live for those 10 hours. And that's where Apple can pay Al Gore $633,000 a year to attend five meetings. McDonald's can pay, I think it was Andrew McKenna, some 80-some-year-old guy, $80 million or whatever it was to sit on their board of directors. And you know what is he doing at that age? They can do that. The companies are fine doing that. They can pay Carly Fiorina. HP can pay her $40 million golden umbrella to go away after she runs their company into the ground. They don't mind doing that, but they really get irked if you want to pay the average worker. Wait a minute, you know, I'm going to pay just for working 10 hours a week. Well, you had to bite the bullet back in the late 30s and go for the 40-hour work week because people like my grandfather worked 12 hours a day, 365 days a year. The reality was back then for a lot of working class people, you worked a 12-hour day. There was no such thing as overtime. There was no such thing as sick leave. He worked up till two weeks before he died of cancer, he had to work deathly ill because he had to feed his family. There were no benefits for people like that. And that was a reality of working class back then. I hope we never go back to that. But unfortunately, a lot of people would like to go back then. And they're not even considering the fact that there are fewer jobs, more job applicants. And again, the only solution to me is you have a much shorter work week like that. And you allow what Huey Long called uh, all people to enjoy the blessings of prosperity. Mm -hmm. And learning about Huey Long was great. I definitely have a Huey Long section here. But, you know, you mentioned earlier that people cope with drugs because they know they're screwed and they can't change the system. It's really not an option for them. And that's the thing. I, I'm sure a lot of people know how bad the system is. But, I mean, is there something we can do on a personal level? Because we can't change it from the top down. I mean, of course, there's things like nobody's stopping us from keeping everything in the family and working together the way the Rockefellers and Rothschilds do. Average families do not do that. We're all kind of off doing our own mediocre job. I mean, that's one thing. But is there a pivot we can make to where 
some of these disadvantages become advantages, like start a corporation or something? I don't know. You know, I think, obviously, I love Huey Long, and my other heroes are John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy. And Robert F. Kennedy made one of the greatest speeches, I think, ever in South Africa, the Tiny Ripples of Hope speech. He talked about any time a man stands up against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And all those tiny ripples of hope gathering together can form a tidal wave and overcome any kind of oppression. So and that's all we can really do. That's what I try to do in my life. And they're definitely tiny ripples. But I try to send forth tiny ripples of hope. And I think if enough of us did that, if we try to be principled and not dishonest, not corrupt, and try to open what people like you are doing with shows like this, you try to wake people up to the corruption around them. I mean, I wrote this book as a standalone issue, but it's really, because I think it's the most important issue that we face, but it's really very much connected to what I wrote about hidden history and what I'll be writing in the books coming out next year, that there's a rig system, there's systemic corruption. This is the most obvious to me, the most obvious giant elephant walking around the room is this disparity of wealth and the fact that it's natural that the people that have money, because it takes money to get power, so money begets power. So obviously, once you have that power, you're going to wield that power for people that have money. I mean, affluence means influence. I have quotes in the book about how impossible it is to get your local school board superintendent to talk to the average citizen, let alone your local congressional representative. But if you were the head of a huge corporation, I guarantee you, you'll be able to go out and have lunch with your local congressional representative because you have affluence. So by virtue of your affluence, you have influence. So we don't have that affluence. But if we come together, as you noted, the power in numbers, and we see that especially in some immigrant families, especially Asian immigrant families, they will work together and pool their resources. And that's why so many can come here and own businesses that Americans couldn't because they're willing to work together. And unfortunately, Americans and that's another subject entirely, but the way our culture is, we become fractured and there's so much dysfunction and feuding in American, you know, the average American group of siblings starting a business together, which, you know, be lucky if there wasn't a murder that happened with, right. within a very short period of time. They just, and I don't know why that is. I think it has a lot to do with the culture and maybe people thinking that's supposed to be the way it is, but it isn't that way all around the world. Same thing with the treatment of the elderly. We treat our elderly horribly. In America, but it's not that way all over the world. Again, if you go in the Asian world, it really anywhere, the Middle Eastern world, elders are revered. Elders are not revered here in America. They're not respected at all and they're treated horribly. Right. Agreed. And you know, tiny ripples of hope, that's a nice sentiment, but from someone who was assassinated by the machine. So it's like really <laughs> difficult to say, exactly. I mean, that we yeah. have a shot. But I did want to ask you more about Huey Long. Maybe that even ties in a little bit when we get to the end of his story. You know, you mentioned a few of the things that he did that people should be grateful for. He's a name I'm sure not many people know, but tell us a little bit more about him. You say he's your all-time political hero. I guess I should probably stop and ponder why my three political heroes are all assassinated. Huey Long, John <laughs> F. Kennedy, Robert. But again, that's indicative of how corrupt things are because you got, Huey Long was assassinated in 1935. So we can see, obviously, this corruption has been around for a long time. But he was very important because not only was the first one to really focus, and he had a catchy, he was a very colorful politician. He would have done great on television and YouTube. He would have been a star. I urge anyone to go out and look at his speeches. They're still wonderful today. He was captivating. Think of like a Donald Trump at his best, but incredibly articulate, incredibly smart. He could encapsulate that little guy against the machine in everything he said. but. When he took over as a Louisiana governor, Louisiana was a huge swamp. He paved the entire state. He did what we need to have done in this country. Our infrastructure is third world status. It hasn't been basically touched for 50 plus years while we've been going in all these absurd wars and wasting money on graft and corruption. And again, these meaningless wars, we've let the country atrophy into third world status. Huey Long faced that with Louisiana because it was a giant swamp. So he did what needed to be done. He built roads and bridges. He paved the entire state. He built universities. He built free health clinics all across the state. He was a man ahead of his time. He invented the concept of adult education. He invented the concept of free textbooks for children. He invented the concept of medical and especially mental health care for prisoners. And he took lots of the prisoners out of those prisons 
and put them in new mental health care facilities. Luckily, I've been able to strike up a relationship with his great granddaughter, who's still fighting the good fight and keeping his legacy alive. And I got lots of stats from their website that are just in finite terms. Unlike any other kind of so called liberal, people in Louisiana could look at what Huey Long did and say, hey, this saved us. And I have the exact numbers in the book, but it was a significant amount every year that the average citizen in, in Louisiana saved in utilities cost, in lower taxes. Ironically, he was doing all the spending, although even though he was spending all this money, Louisiana had the third lowest cost of all the states in the union because, again, he was eliminating waste. He was going after Standard Oil and the Rockefeller. He was making them pay money, which is why he was despised. But for the average guy, 80% of the people in the state had their property taxes eliminated. He basically eliminated foreclosures on properties. He did everything that we expect a do-gooder type of liberal to do. And we haven't really seen his like ever before or since. Just look up the numbers in my book and see what this guy did. And just imagine, he was talking about literally a month after on this floor of the Senate. It's still in the congressional record, so people can go look and see. He did all but accuse the Roosevelt administration of plotting to kill him, but he certainly talked about powerful forces plotting to assassinate him. And then, lo and behold, he was assassinated a month later, right after he announced that he was going to run for president in 1936. Now, just imagine what he could have done for the country. And he was a genuine anti-war guy, unlike Roosevelt and most of the Democrats and all the Republicans. So I don't think we would have been involved in World War II, certainly against World War I. I think that the world would have been entirely different. We can't even imagine what the world would have been like. And if what he did for Louisiana happened all across the America, I can't imagine what a share of the wealth movement would have been like because he was talking about confiscating the wealth and the wealth, not just the income. And that's the difference between somebody like Huey Long and your average liberal. The average liberal just wants to raise taxes on the wealthy, but they have all their loopholes. And so they still end up <laughs> paying nothing but also raise taxes significantly on the so-called middle class, which goes down way too low. And so what you do is you have a drain of money from that middle class, and maybe a little bit trickles down to those just below them. But nothing really ever changes where what we need to do is go after what Huey Long talked about. He actually wanted to exempt the first million dollars of income from taxation under his share of the wealth plan. People don't talk about that, which would be like $12 million today. So you know who he was going after. He understood where the wealth was. Even in those days, the Rockefeller Foundations and things like that were just getting started. We can't even imagine today how much money is in the Bill Gates Foundation or the foundations of people like that. That's where the hidden wealth is, not to mention the Rothschilds, these shadowy figures that are everywhere. We can't even really get a grasp on how much wealth is there. But Huey Long knew the wealth was at the top. And that's all he was talking. He wasn't talking about anybody average person, they would benefit from it. He certainly wasn't talking about taking what they had, as I hear from so many people when I talk about this. Oh, yeah, you just, I worked hard for mine. Well, you don't have anything. Nobody's, nobody's going to take your money, but everybody has that impression. And Huey Long wanted no one to have more than, I think he was going to cap fortunes at something like 10 million or whatever it was. It changed, right? Which would be like 40 million today. Does anybody really need more than 40 million? And he thought that everybody should have a place to live. At that time, I think his idea was that everybody could have a shelter, a car, which was essential, and I think a radio, which was the newest. So would it have been completely practical? Obviously, it would have been maybe complicated, but he was able to do that in Louisiana. So I think that's what we need. And I understand I'm probably a voice crying in the wilderness on that because I'm sure I'd be attacked so much by the right on that, but I don't see any other way around it unless you just want to have this disparity of wealth, which is just growing and growing and eventually is going to make us a total third world country. Right. I mean, green paper, these numbers on the screen, this is one form of currency, but you don't need more than 40 million. I mean, when people are dying because they're in poverty, you should be able to see, well, okay, you know, I'll make my sacrifices at 40 million. I mean, that's reasonable to me. And like I said, I don't have any problem with people being successful, but it's when you alter the game, it's when you tilt the scales, it's when you assassinate the people that are fighting for our side. Like, look, battle it out in the arena of ideas. If you can fool us with trickle-down economics, our bad. 
But when you're killing the people that are on our side, now this is messed up. Yeah. And uh, you have a chapter in the book called Prophets Before Progress, which is probably my favorite because it does touch on this stuff. The active suppressing of alternative fuels or technologies that could make the world better. And that kind of thing pisses me off more than pretty much all other things. So talk to us a little bit about this chapter. Yeah, well, I mean, I talked in there about Stanley Meyer, you know, the guy that invented the car that ran on water or whatever. And, so, yeah. and I've tried to track his brother down. I think his twin brother's still alive. But I mean, I think the YouTube video is still out there. And this made local news. They had a local news report that used to be on a YouTube video, if it's still there. And they showed how, I mean, it looked like a dune buggy or something, but it was obviously just a working model. You didn't have enough money, I guess, to actually put it into a real car that we were used to seeing. But it supposedly ran, I think, across the country on one or two gallons worth of water, nothing else, and then ran back on one or two gallons worth of water. He was, I believe, meeting at a restaurant with some potential investors. And one of these, as I write so much about in history and all everything else, these unnatural deaths, which are everywhere. <laughs> and they just happen like they're scripted. But I mean, he literally suddenly felt ill and went outside and just basically died. They don't really know if it was food poisoning or what, but very strangely, his plans apparently, I don't know if they disappeared or whatever, his twin brother who was working with him wasn't able to keep up with it, but there are lots of things like that. And there are other inventors that have existed that have invented things like this, but look at it from the point of view, like I've said for a long time, if someone came up, I mean, we, I think we know at this point that cancer is largely contrived and they could easily get rid of it because it's man-made. And the book that's coming out next year about earlier conspiracies, I go into this a little bit more about how cancer wasn't even on the radar around 1900. It didn't exist. And they've actually studied the remains of hundreds and hundreds of mummies from antiquity, and they basically found there was no evidence of cancer anywhere. So obviously, this is a modern thing. How it was created, what exactly, we don't know. But if someone, let's just say someone came up with a magic pill, a vaccine or whatever that actually worked, and you took it and no more cancer. Well, what would that do to this medical industrial complex? And the people that make the money they make off it, the doctors, the big pharma, the insurance companies, hospital administrators, just imagine the kind of money they would stand to lose. So of course, you could almost see how they couldn't let that happen. And the same thing would be for inventors. If the oil companies, I go for the stats there and how much money the big oil companies make. It's astonishing the kind of profits they make. And it has nothing to do with being a genius. If you're selling something that the world is dependent on, you know, you don't have to be a great used car salesman to sell people. They have to go and buy gas. So you're right. It's going to be impossible for you to fail at that. And the world's dependent on it because you made it that way. You killed off all the competition. Like it's not literally the one source of fuel or the one source <laughs> of energy that we have. I mean, people don't understand that there are way more empowering and cheaper technologies, medicines, energy systems, all suppressed over the years. And some people see flying saucers in the sky and you can't help but wonder how far that suppressed technology theme goes. I mean, they're never going to tell us. So all you can do is speculate. Right. But if any kind of alternative energy fuel, there's a guy named John Newman that I wrote about in the book. And I actually tried to contact him and his representative got back to me and I never got to talk to him though. But I'd known about John Newman since the 80s and he developed some kind of device and he exhibited it in arenas. The FDA supposedly, why the FDA was in charge, I don't know, but they have jurisdiction over this. They supposedly looked at, and the patent people supposedly looked at his invention and they couldn't find any examples of trickery but they just said it's scientifically impossible. Because basically what it is, he claimed he could put a small device under the hood of your car and your car would run forever. Hmm. And it would cost a couple hundred bucks. And he said he could take a bigger device, put it in your house, it might cost $500, and you'd have all the electricity you wanted forever. Too. So obviously something like that, what would that do? Now, in his case, he's even, and I don't know how he's still alive, but he is, but he hasn't been able to patent his device. Obviously, the oil companies, look what they would stand to lose on something like that. And we go back to Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla wanted free energy for all. And what happened is records. There's still television shows trying to find out where his record, and no one apparently has taken up his work. And then what, I guess he died in the 30s, 40s. So you're talking about uh, 80 years or something since he died, even though he's very famous. I mean, people talk about him all the time. 
Somebody should be looking at his research. But Newman's, if something like that would not only affect the gas companies, look at what money they would lose, but the utility companies. So your free energy for all, free power for all, that doesn't fit into the America. America has become something way beyond free enterprise. We're into crony capitalism and we're into Ayn Rand territory. Greed is good. Whatever's good. If it makes money, it's good. And so people just kind of roll their eyes. First of all, they don't believe that such things can exist. I mean, I guess they think that all the great inventions stopped in you know the early 1900s, but these things have been tested and they should at least be permitted. But we see even something as simple as the electric car. I mean, I drive a hybrid and I just like getting that much better gas mileage. It's nice. But just an electric car, something like that has been priced so that, again, it's out of the reach of most people who would like to maybe do that. But it's not financially feasible yet because whether it's they're keeping it that high or not enough people can afford it yet. But even something, and that's an advance, but it's not it's not the kind of what you're talking about and the few examples I gave are real alternative energy. But, you know, you go back and look at something like Jimmy Carter's speeches during his administration when he was talking about solar power and we need to conserve energy. We haven't moved one iota since the 70s. You're talking about 40 years. We haven't progressed at all. I mean, there's a little effort, I guess, at solar power here or there, but nothing really special. And we're still going after the fossil fuels. And certainly with Republicans in there, I don't think there's a dime's worth of difference between the parties. But on an issue like this, you see their dependence on fossil fuels is just the Trump types are just over the top in their support of it. Yeah, we need to drill for oil. We need to do that. That's much as Reagan did in the 80s. Right after Carter, Reagan just went right back to the old way of doing it. And that's the most profitable. I understand it. You know, they're, They've got businesses to think about because that's all they're thinking about. So it's all about profit and thus the title of that chapter. Profits always come first with these people. Mm -hmm. Man, I really do love that chapter. Like you said, you cover Tesla. You also talk about Wilhelm Reich. And that Stanley Meyer example is probably my favorite. The guy built that water-powered car, and then he was in a Cracker Barrel in 1998 with his brother and meeting with two Belgian investors. He grabs his neck, runs out to the parking lot, and his brother's like, what's going on, man? And his last <laughs> words are, they poisoned me. And then, of course, the cause of death shows that it was something else, call it a brain aneurysm. Maybe that's caused by a chemical, who knows? But- <laughs> You know, he then calls the investors and says, hey, my brother died that day. And they're like stone cold about it. No condolences, just radio silence. And it's like, of course, you pose as an investor. You're in that industry. So you're like, oh, I'm fascinated by this. You meet the guy, you kill him. And you're like, all right, now we can go back to making money. Yeah. It's hard not to be paranoid. And you write about it. People ask me that all the time, because especially if you read Hidden History, I mean, Stories like that are throughout the book, because when you get in the more overt political world, these unnatural deaths, these body counts are everywhere. People falling out of high buildings and, you know, being found on train tracks and just the general public don't die that way. But people connected to these events tend to be found dead in the woods, you know, to tend to die of natural causes at 35. I mean, crazy stuff like that. But everybody knows kind of with a wink and a nod, yeah, that's what happened. But nobody really acknowledges it. and so. Something like this, clearly, if you wrote a movie script like that, everybody would know what happened to Stanley Meyer. Mm -hmm. They would know, okay, well, yeah, he threatened some really powerful interests. Somebody silenced him. Where are his work? And again, I tried to find his twin brother. I would love to say, you know, what happened? Were you just kind of such a silent partner? You didn't really know what was behind all this? Or was it just him? No one else knew? Because then that's what is mystifying with a lot of these things is that Tesla we know was a tremendously isolated figure. I mean, this guy was really such an eccentric personality. He was your quintessential mad scientist, although I think he was really working for the common good. But he had that kind of, you know, he was completely isolated. So he wasn't really sharing his research with anybody. But still, he should have papers there and somebody should be, especially as many fans as he has. But other than naming the Tesla car... I haven't seen anybody, you know, I, I like to follow up on that free energy, not so much the death ray, but, you know, yeah. the, the free energy. And same thing with Wilhelm Reich. I mean, Wilhelm Reich was a less publicized figure, but certainly his organ accumulator was just, uh, and, you know, his theories are 
fascinating. I mean, they're out there and people just kind of roll their eyes at it. But, you know, to have something like that, a box where you can cure people of diseases with that, with the energy from orgasms or whatever, yeah. you're talking about this Oregon language, it sounds far out, but apparently, and the fact that he was thrown into prison, he died, and again, all his papers were confiscated by the, why were his papers confiscated? It's craziness. Let's be able to look at him. So these are the kind of things that they just shut down all of these people. You go back to a guy named John Keeley. I don't believe I mentioned him in the book, but he was, you know, supposedly invented a perpetual motion machine back in the 1800s. So you've had these types of people throughout history, but something always happens with them. They usually die strangely. As I said, Joe Newman stands out that he's still alive, but, or they're ignored as in his case, but people tend to go this state route. I mean, I, I grew up again in the 60s and 70s and I thought, man, I want to drive one of those cool little flying bubble cars the Jetsons have. You know that. <laughs> but if you look at the predictions that were made, they had these world fairs they used to have every so often, and the world's tomorrow at Disney World. And they envisioned a world, you know, in the year 2000 that was so far in advance to what we have in the year 2018. It's not even funny. We really haven't progressed. We're driving the same kinds of cars. All the airplanes are that old. The train tracks haven't been upgraded. The means of transportation are almost identical. I mean, at this point, you know, I envision not only flying jets and bubble cars, but maybe teleportation pods like uh -huh. we saw at Star. I mean, things like that that would really, that's what you think of when you think of futuristic and technology, but it just hasn't happened. Now, whether it's been thwarted by that, but just looking at the alternative energy thing, and we know what happened to people like Stanley Meyer and Joe Newman. We can only imagine how many people that might be building things like that. They might have built teleportation pads. If you built something like that, what would that do to the uh, the flight industry? Right. <laughs> so again, I think that's what they look at first. It's first and foremost, it's a dollar figure. Wait a minute, that's going to impact. That'll affect the economy. So I really think they suppress it. And whether you go to the lengths of actually killing these people, well, I mean, they die that way. So people can draw their own conclusions on that. <laughs> Yeah, man. Cheers to all that. And another big wake up call for me doing this show and previous episodes was learning that prohibition didn't really have anything to do with alcohol consumption. They don't care if we drink ourselves to death, but most farmers at that time had stills and all their tractors and early cars could run on alcohol. Well, we can't have that. And now they give it to us in uh, like ethanol and they kind of say, guys, we're trying. But it's like, you're not trying. That was here 100 years ago. Yeah, the first electric car was about that time, too. So, yeah. And again, I spoke about people like the Rockefellers that had a monopoly on Standard Oil. This new invention, automobiles, everybody was going to be driving one. They saw that. And people like Henry Ford cut the prices on them famously and gave his workers a pay raise. So I want to be able to afford my product so everybody could buy a Model T. Well, they were concerned. The Standard Oil people like that were fighting. Hey, wait a minute. You talk about seeing dollar signs, man, all these people have to run on our product. Just imagine what kind of money we're going to make. So, of course, they're going to go with that rather than the farmers and their stills or electricity, which, again, is harder to something like electricity unless you can come up with some kind of a utility monopoly, which I'm sure they would. I think the only way you'll ever see electric cars everywhere, they're going to come up with some kind of monopolistic thing where they can profit from charging centers or they'll come up some kind of way where they can kind of at least make up some of the profit they'll lose in the gas and oil companies. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, Donald, that pretty much brings us to the end of the line. I think I'm depressed enough for one day. <laughs> <laughs> you are obviously super knowledgeable, really great talking to you. It's nice to have a fairness advocate out there. I don't think people realize just how much money is really in the mix versus what trickles down to us. So great job laying it all out there. Anything else in the works or projects you want to tell people about before we call it in? You mentioned a book coming out next year. Yeah, next spring I have, it's basically Hidden History too. For some reason they didn't want that title. So it, the official title is Crimes and Cover-Ups in American Politics, 1776 to 1963. I'll have lots of controversial stuff to say about Abraham Lincoln and FDR and Woodrow Wilson and things like that. So I'll catch a lot of flack from that because it is controversial, but I think people will find it real interesting. And I also have a book hopefully coming out next fall with another publisher. It's called A Bullyocracy, which is going to be about uh, bullying in the social hierarchy in schools. It's kind of a different subject, but it's very controversial in and of itself. So I 
I'm writing all the time, so hopefully you'll see more books down the road. Right on. Very cool. Well, again, big thanks for the book and for being here. Important work. Keep fighting the good fight and good luck on restoring an authentic left. Oh, thanks for having me, Greg. <laughs> you got it, man. Take care. And there we have it, guys. Donald Jeffries dropping knowledge on just how tilted the scales really are. You know, I struggled with this one a little bit, feeling like we might be preaching to the choir because we know the system is unfair. But really, it's good to go over these things again, reinforce what we know, re-examine the details, and like I say a lot, give us the data to make better arguments when we're dealing with one of those Kool-Aid drinkers. We all know them. We all have Kool-Aid drinkers that we love, system proper-uppers that are in our friends and family circles, and it's nice to shore up those arguments for when we might have a little bit of a conflict with some of them. And a lot like Gordon was saying last week, you don't have to hit them with everything at once. You can just kind of Socrates them into coming to these conclusions themselves by asking the right questions, making the right points. Do you really think the traditional path offers the same opportunity for everyone? Is just working hard enough to get you where you want to be? And it's surprising how long we can go sometimes without a deep personal reflection on these things. I'm guilty of it. So I think those are the parts that are most useful. Then we talked about Huey Long. I thought that was great because history books usually leave out the people who at least tried to be champions of the everyman and then add in the fact that he was killed for it. And it's even more reason to pay homage to his legacy. In fact, I found a recording of that Huey Long song and I'm going to throw it in right here. Why we far slumber America, land of brave and true, with castles and clothing and food for all, all belong to you. Every man a king, every man a king, for you can be a millionaire. But there's something belonging to others, there's enough for all people to share. When it's sunny June and December too, or in the winter time or spring, there'll be peace without end. Every neighbor a friend with every man a king. I always just get a kick out of really old timey stuff like that. And when I listen to the lyrics, I could understand how it might trigger someone into thinking breadline, socialism, universal poverty. But we just spent two hours talking about how much excess is at the top. Billions and trillions. So nobody's talking about universal poverty here. And you know, of course, I love talking about suppressed technology. So I thought we had some good content there that wasn't just the same top three bullet points. And lastly, I really enjoyed getting into Don's head a bit about his politics and his feelings about what a more traditional or genuine left position looks like. I'm not saying I agree with every element. I just like to listen and reflect and see where the common ground is. We always have in us the way we were raised, so something about liberalism is in my DNA somewhere. Not the way it's expressed today, but I would hope that there would be something else there of value. Because I don't want people to hear me say that and then look at the liberal philosophy today and consider them equal, because I do not. So I typically stay away from political labels because they just mean so many different things to so many different people, and they do change over time. So I guess the question I was thinking about when getting familiar with Don's work and knowing that I'm about to interview him was just that I picked up on this thread of what was the left really, or what could it be without all the co-option and without equating it to socialism, Obviously, I'm not in favor of a welfare state or weakening people's drive with handouts, but some people do get chewed up and spit out by the system at no fault of their own. I think I've said this before too, but for myself, it's best to have a conservative philosophy. Nobody's going to help me. I got to pull myself up by the bootstraps. I got to be the best guy I can be. I have to limit my partying a little bit, you know. I'm quite hard on myself sometimes, quite stern. And for me, that's motivating. It's very helpful. 
But I think there's a difference between what we instill in ourselves as individuals and a philosophy that's going to work better for a society overall. And I'm not making any conclusions. I'm not saying I'm sure. I'm just talking about ideas. And this is just how I feel about it. So I thought there were some interesting things to pull out and examine when it comes to what a non-socialist, non-globalist, non-co-opted left might look like. We know it doesn't look like that today. That's obvious. But is there something there at the beginning that has value? Today made me feel like there might be more than most days do. That's all I'm saying. Personally, I don't put immigration very high on my priority list either. Obviously, there is a line, and Europe is dealing with their own thing. But as far as America goes, I live near the border. I don't see a huge flood of violent criminals crossing the border. Nobody's breaking into my house. No one's breaking into my car. In Missouri, people broke into my car and stole my stereo like six times. And this is just one man's experience. I don't care what the TV says. I don't care what the media tells me I should be up in arms about. My experience just doesn't look anything like that. We obviously have issues overall with immigration. There's some stuff there that could be improved, but there are so, so, so many higher priorities in my mind. It's like your house is burning down and you're mad because you found some ants in the kitchen. You know what I mean? Let's reel back the waste that Don was talking about. Let's redistribute some of the war machine, military, industrial complex budget to more positive things. Let's rebuild the infrastructure. Let's take these corporations to task for polluting the planet. Reignite some of these suppressed technologies. Refocus our food on being a more local level operation. And get clean goddamn water in our houses for Christ's sake. These are the things that I care about so much more than immigration. I know it's a hot topic right now, but I think that a lot of it is media hyperbole. And if you look around in your own life, I don't think you're going to see the immigration crisis that the media tells you is there. We have a homelessness crisis, and those things have a little bit of bleed over. But I would ask, what has affected your life more? The fact that Harmful chemicals are pumped into your water supply, or a Mexican family trying to find some relief in America. I don't want to frame it as an either or choice, but it's just not my go to issue. And again, what do I know? There are a lot of issues that you don't see firsthand, but are still issues. I'm not trying to be unfair. But all in all, I found a lot of Don's ideas and the Huey Long style leftist to just be interesting. Again, both parties are just so far off from their initial philosophies. Conservatives want to talk about a free market. That is an absolute joke. The conservatives that are actually in decision-making positions are fighting on behalf of monopolies for the most part. So again, with the left, I don't want higher taxes. I don't want to increase a welfare state. I don't want more censorship. But I do want sensible regulations. I do want to try to work towards everyone having a fairer chance. I'm sure if we strip down a lot of political positions and philosophies to their core or their origins, we'd probably be able to endorse a lot of left or right things. It's just that we are so far off from that core. Everything has been spun out of control to benefit the capstone cabal. They are masters at the Trojan horse, at the bait and switch, and of using a people's philosophies against them. Hopefully you guys see what I'm saying and also see the value in what Don was trying to articulate. Even if you're on the right, we don't get anywhere by being harsh and uncompromising. I myself have found several right-of-the-aisle voices that I really do agree with and really appreciate. Maybe if you're more right-leaning, you could at least see some value in a Huey Long left position, even if you don't adopt it. I want to pull back that polarization and find the common ground. But if you did enjoy the first hour with Mr. Jeffries, our second hour continued along a lot of these same tracks, and we got into some of the content from his Hidden History book as well. We talked about how the robber barons did it better. Obviously, that's a little tongue-in-cheek, but the point is that the elite of past generations, past eras, 
realized that if you choke us out too much, you break the system. And now you're just on top of rubble. And that's no good because the screws are tightening. But we also talked about what was truly behind the Reagan assassination attempt. And we got an analysis of the JFK research community's reaction to current politics. I really thought that was eye-opening because we get twisted up in being manipulated by the media and we forget some of our own ideas because there was a lot of Trump analysis there and I thought it was really even-handed. And if you frame the current dynamic as the deep state versus Trump, which is obviously not exactly right, but that's what the media is going with in the mainstream narrative, he is fighting the deep state, draining the swamp, Gordon had a good line in his newsletter that the swamp isn't being drained, it's being landscaped. I like that. But just for the sake of argument, if these are the two sides, you got people who really, really hate Trump, and they're kind of putting themselves on the side of Team Deep State, but they've been a JFK assassination researcher for years? Like, I find that interesting. We also talked about the top-down pressure put on the masses to live with lower standards and the increases in that agenda. And again, trying to bring back a true left as opposed to a warped version that we have today in American politics. So a good time with a knowledgeable, authentic guy. I really liked his book. He's trying to restore some sanity to an insane world. And that's something we can all try to do, right? So I've done my part. Your move, insulated elite, system riggers, and neck stompers of us little guys. Your fucking move. They built a little empire out of some crazy garbage called the blood of the exploited working class. But they've overcome their shyness. Now we're called. They destroyed the bonds of friendship and respect Between the only people left Who'd even look them in the eye Now they laugh and make a fortune Off the same ones that they tortured And a world screams Save me, THC the blood